Welcome to University Drive, your pathway to the transformational work of University of the Bahamas. Our goal is to build a better Bahamas by shaping tomorrow's leaders today, finding solutions to challenges, and forging new opportunities for growth. University Drive, where faculty, staff, students, and alumni travel the road of progress together with you. Hello everyone and welcome to University Drive. I'm your host, Tamika Lundy. Imagine for a moment a shimmering network of solar panels floating atop a body of water. As the sun beams down, these panels harness the energy to power homes, schools, businesses, and everything in between, reducing our dependency on fossil fuels and moving us closer to a more sustainable future. Our guest today, envisions water-based systems that could transform how we generate energy without compromising valuable land or fragile ecosystems. We'll be discussing the potential benefits, challenges, and exciting opportunities and possibilities of this innovative approach to renewable energy. Welcome Dr. Brandon Bethel, coordinator of the Small Island Sustainability Program at University of the Bahamas, Dr. Bethel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so very much for having me. Absolutely. You are also one of the newest scholars for the Wilson Awards, are you not? I most certainly am. Congratulations on that. So tell us about your background. This is the first time that you're joining us and how you came to be a faculty member at UB. Well, I think the story really began uh, back in, I think, 2010, uh, when I was a student here at the then College of the Bahamas. Um, I was a typical student. Um, I did biology with chemistry, you know, nothing too uh, awesome in terms of grades. Um, but there was one afternoon where I was just walking along uh, in the A block and I stumbled upon a, uh, an advertisement for a Chinese uh, language class. Um, now, you may recall that at the time, this was very brand new uh, to the university itself. Um, but, you know, I saw it and um, for the next few months uh, after that encounter, I was looking for the class and I never actually found it. Um, but there was uh, one day where I had just stumbled upon um, a woman named Gao Hui. And she was the one that taught the class. And she had informed me that, that uh, although the class had ended because the semester was over, if I left my name and number, um, then she would be sure uh, to put me in the class for the next semester. Now, it just so happens that I'd very summer, uh, they were sending five Bahamians, um, well, should have sent five Bahamians across the China to study abroad for one year. Um, but one person did not um, have uh, a passport, a Bahamian passport. And so that person was not eligible. But of course, um, I had just left my name and number. So whomever that person is were removed and I was put in. And starting in 2011, um, I went to China, I did a year and it's it's been... 10 years since then, where I've learned the Chinese language, I'm very fluent in it. It's a, it's a hobby now. Um, but what really changed my life wasn't the trip itself, but the fact that um, marine science was a course that was available for study. That's something that um, at the time, as far as I knew, didn't exist. And it was captivating. We were from an island nation and it's, you know, it's amazing that I had to leave home to go to China to learn marine science, but learn it, I did. And I look back at the time and I wonder who or what I would be if not that initial opportunity. All right, a full circle moment. And now we are all benefiting more broadly from the depth and breadth of your talents. Well, believe me when I say that um, the work that um, I've done so far is merely the tip of the iceberg. Once we can get the technology uh, in country, and it is, once we can get uh, government approvals to get it on the uh, on either lakes or in the coastal zone, then an array of uh, subsequent studies can come out of it. And it's not just for energy generation, that's the main purpose. Um, but you can then look into shading the ocean in a very small way, but 
when you consider the fact that you have coral reefs that are bleaching due to waters that are too warm, if you block the sun from said coral reefs, you can try to reduce the temperature just a little bit and give uh, those organisms a chance um, you know, at, at survival. It's more or less like an AC uh, for a coral reef, but uh, another few months, you know, over this next year, uh, 2025, there's going to be an amazing array of things that we can do once we get the uh, kinks knocked out of this technology that uh, we brought in country. Futuristic, strategic, and sustainability. We'll keep that as our watchwords as this conversation unfolds. What sparked your interest in solar energy? Well, I think, and this is something I had mentioned before uh, in the conversation uh, during the Wilson Grant presentations last week, is that uh, most Bahamians, if not all of us, would have had memories of when the power was out. Um, you know, it's sad to say that one of my earliest memories um, was, you know, when the power went out. And, you know, hearing a beep uh, in my house somewhere that signified that the power had returned was, you know, an, ex an extraordinarily happy moment. Because now um, you can turn the fan back on, turn the AC back on, keep the mosquitoes at bay, um, you know, use the computer. Anything that requires electricity was taken away from you every time the power went out. Um, and that's something that I don't intend my own children to ever experience. So it was really born out of um, frustration. And I think everybody in the country would um, know and know very well. That uh, should not happen in, 20, uh, sorry, in um, the 21st century. And I intend using solar energy and other forms of ultra renewable energy. Put a stop to that. How did you land on the specific research that you're pursuing on implementing solar panel arrays in the Bahamas, which um, as you, as we all can, can hear is really an innovative approach to renewable energy, but it's also to me a natural approach for energy generation in the Bahamas, which is largely made up of water. Well, I think the best answer I can give is that I once interned at uh, a BPL back in 2017, um, just shortly after I finished my uh, undergraduate and I had started my master's degree. Um, we, my mother, my mother and I, we were driving past Lake Cunningham, and I looked at it and I remarked, "Look at just, just look at how flat and glassy that surface is. As far as uh, a solar panel is concerned, it's no different from, you know, let's say a roof or the land itself. There's no difference uh, with with regards to the panels. And so that was something that um, really piqued my curiosity from then. And then, then I advanced my career." I understood some of the uh, geophysical factors behind, uh, let's say, oceanography in general. Um, how can we find areas which would have, uh, let's say, minimum uh, wind speeds, minimal wave heights? These now would be the areas you would want to put your solar panels so that they don't uh, jostle too much. That up and down in the waves, where you would have, um, you know, roll, uh, roll, uh, pitch, heave motions. You want to find a place that would be close to a transmission grid, which Lake Kalani has. Oh, sorry, Lake, um, Lake Cunningham. You also want to have a place where the ocean, the lake surface, the ocean surface is very quiescent. Um, as I mentioned before, it was a very glassy surface and anybody driving along that road can see that. Um, and it would allow for an ease of access. And so all of those factors then came into uh, the realization that yes, um, while solar energy is a very mature technology, um, the issues with it primarily of course is that once you run out of roof space, or you run out of space on land, then you have nowhere else to go. You can only increase, uh, let's say, the per panel uh, efficiency you know, of the array. You can increase um, your output that way, but in terms of uh, spatial expansion, you can't move an inch. But those uh, water bodies, the lakes, um, the wider ocean, and in fact, uh, one thing I would say is that uh, as a country with 100,000 square miles of ocean, there are quite literally 100,000 square miles of opportunity for endeavors just like this. And this is something that I believe um, is uh, a path forward. The technology is not new. It's um, been used all over the world. Um, Asia's uh, uh, a hotspot for it. Um, North America is there, Europe is there. Um, you know, Africa is uh, doing um, you know, remarkable, work, remarkable work in this area. But I thought that why can't I bring that to the Bahamas? Why can't we use our, well, our second most important resource because the first most important resource would be the people but our second most important resource the ocean is right there um ready for not exploitation and that's a uh, careful uh word i'm using here not for exploitation but for sustainable development and so the idea uh started itself on a simple drive past lake cunningham 
after spending uh, a couple hours interning at EPL. So let's talk more specifically about it. What are the benefits and what are the challenges though? Well, I think the most immediate benefit is that you would not need to uh, use another inch uh, of land again. Um, that's been completely eliminated. Um, but another more important benefit is that uh, because the solar panels, they are, uh, their power output is inversely proportional to its temperature. That is, uh, as the temperature goes up, the power output goes down, which means that if you were to find a way to cool those panels down, then you can try to get uh, more energy output for, uh, for a square meter of panel that you have. Which means then if you were to put, it, um, put your panels or let's say on your roof, right? You would want to have a gap between the roof and a panel itself to allow air to flow under it to cool it down. Yes, that's one way of doing it. But if we were to have uh, the same effect uh, with operating over a water body, it then means that the cooling effect would be many times greater than what air can do alone. So first consideration would be the elimination of land. But the second consideration now is that you can make your entire array more efficient simply by cooling uh, the panels down. And this, of course, is a passive cooling. We need not add energy into the system to achieve uh, the cooling effect. But beyond that, um, as I mentioned before, the coral reefs, if, for example, you have a patch of ocean that is, um, you know, it has a coral reef that is uh, very, very sensitive on its way to dying, then you can shade uh, that uh, coral reef by the solar panels and even if you needed to uh, build a heat pump, that is to suck even more heat from around the water, around the uh, coral reefs and make it cooler. Um, that's another application. It's, it's really uh, and truly when you have uh, energy, there's very little in this universe you can't do. That's what I, I would wanna say. Uh, am I hearing you talk about increased energy yield then from this kind of most certainly, configuration? Yes, most certainly. So for an equivalent uh, array, uh, let's say on land, that's the same in every way, but on land, you should expect anywhere between five, maybe even 10% efficiency. Well, raise efficiency, I should say, raise efficiency. What's the, what's the impact, if any, on the ecosystem? Well, one critical um, determinant on what your array is going to do to the environment is the amount of coverage area uh, that you're looking at uh, for your water body. Um, so for example, uh, in the study, we limited it to a maximum of 30%. And that is because uh, it's been uh, shown in other studies that uh, if you were to exceed that 30% um, coverage area, then you would have uh, significant changes uh, in, let's say, the temperature profile uh, of your water body or um, your phytoplankton count uh, will decrease because of course the phytoplankton are dependent on sunlight. Um, but some of the positive benefits of course is that because you would have your structure on the ocean, the fish that are nearby would use that now as an agglomeration area. So they would feel that it's a, it's a protected area. So yes, there are negative uh, benefits, uh, sorry, negative side effects with technology here. And this is why the uh, coverage area should be limited, um, balanced off between uh, energy, gener energy generation potential but also your environmental footprint. But on the other side, um, you can derive some benefits, um, environmental benefits of the system itself uh, once you can carefully, and I mean very carefully, calibrate um, its positive effects, uh, let's say in terms of keeping, uh, you know, providing an area for a fish to huddle upon, you know, to be uh, away from predators. Or as I mentioned, you know, it's the third time now that the um, coral reefs reducing the uh, incident water temperature. The environmental footprint, uh, let's say, for the Bahamas would have to be uh, assessed. And that's something that I have to start to do um, you know, early next year. It's going to run for about a year. So we need to understand um, you know, what are the biological effects, the chemical effects, um, what are the physical effects. Um, of course, let's say if you were to uh, remove uh, surface area for the wind to push on the ocean surface, that changes some physical variables as well. And so the physics, the chemistry, the biology, it's all uh, need to be considered all at the same time. But for a specific effect, We'll have to wait for the research to come out. And uh, one thing I can say uh, for those who may not be so, um, let's say, you know, open to the idea of testing these things in uh, our environment, um, the fact of the matter is, if if um, we knew what we were doing, if we knew what the effects were, it wouldn't be called research. And research now would be the foundation for our modern life. And so we need to do that research. Okay, so let's take it slowly now. Give us an overview of how the floating solar panels would work compared to the traditional 
land-based systems in terms of infrastructure, implementation, maintenance, and the like. What are we talking about here? Well, in terms um, of infrastructure, um, you would need to get uh, some HDPE floats. Um, this is, I think, uh, high-density polyurethane uh, floats. That now would be your, uh, your factory to have the panels to float on the water surface itself. But because of that, then you need to have um, infrastructure to anchor your floating array to the seabed itself. So you're going to have to do that. Um, but, but the benefit, of course, is that when you have uh, strong winds, strong waves, unlike the land-based systems where you can't move them once they've been installed, it'll take a very long time. The floating array, by contrast, you can simply disconnect it from the seabed and tug boat it away to somewhere safe. Um, and so that's the major difference between uh, a land-based system and an ocean-based system. Well, do we have the expertise in order to be able to transition into such a system if that is indeed what occurs? Most certainly. There's been a, um, a, uh, a class at ETVI um, that's been training people in the installation of solar energy and solar panels. Um, that's already been underway for maybe over a year now. And so the only thing that needs to be transitioned, um, let's say for an ocean-based system is that we just need to teach those people how to swim and that would be it. Um, in terms of infrastructure, you can leave the island just as it is. Um, you would simply have a cable running from your water body to the nearest substation and you're good to go. And so the infrastructure, the um, uh, expertise is quite already in place and it's just simply you know, bringing the technology in, adapting it to our specific use and you plug and play. This is research that you're still investigating, but tell us what you've been able to uncover so far in terms of implementation on the ground. What have you been able to deduce? Because you also, as I mentioned earlier, you have been given the, the Wilson Award that helps you a little bit with uh, further research that you need to undertake. But what have you been able to uncover so far? Are there any conclusions that you can share with us? Most certainly. Um, I think the first uh, most important uh, conclusion so far is that um, at least for the residents of Cory Sound, um, that's in Coral Lakes, uh, near Adelaide, they're more than willing to give it a try. Um, they're sitting next to the lake. It doesn't have um, you know, any other economic uh, you know, say, um, purposes behind it. No one's fishing there. No one is um, you know, jet skiing there, nothing at all. And yes, it does have aesthetic value, yes, but in terms of trying to find ways to reduce the cost of electricity, they're more than willing to give it a try. Um, so that's the first result um, that we've had. Um, but secondly, we found that um, based on about 38 sites uh, nationwide, which accounts for about 99% of the entire Bahamian population, we can supply in many cases um, thousands, and I mean, I mean this, literally thousands of times the amount of energy that a given settlement, a given island would, would, would need. Um, so the example I would give is that uh, this rum key, uh, anywhere between 60, 70, maybe let's say 100 people. Um, but if you were to apply the constraints uh, of the uh, floating photovoltaic array, for Rumki using its two main water bodies, then we can get approximately 14,000 times the amount of energy that, um, that the uh, residents of Rumki would use. So that's 14,000 times the population that would be able to exist using the energy that we can generate there. Which then means that um, considering uh, that we need to develop our family islands, that you can now invite, um, say, uh, foreign entities uh, to bring uh, you know, the infrastructure of which we know what to do best, and that is, uh, of course, tourism. And you tell these industries that, you know, you come in, you set up shop, um, we provide uh, electricity to you to uh, a very minimal cost, if any cost, and your job now is to take care of this community. You build schools, you build um, hospitals, you build police stations, um, make the community yours. We provide electricity to you. You employ residents uh, of Rumki, uh, and then now we can start to even pull some of the population from New Providence into the family islands once we make energy available. So we can go into all of the nerdy details, right? But I think um, the results that are more important to the Bahamian population is that we can uh, decisively show that we can reduce your energy costs, but also we can stimulate, trigger additional economic activity, which now would give us that uh, economic strength to live our lives in the way that we choose. I think those are the two most important um, conclusions from the research so far. 
So in my view, you're talking absolutely language that consumers and citizens would want to hear. So there's the research, the implementation, the infrastructure, the resources, but I also hear that you're really talking about a change in mindset, aren't you? Most certainly. Um, We're going to have to accept the proposition um, that we'll have to balance, uh, let's say, economic development in a slightly different way. Um, I know, and of course, I... I'm in this field and I may get some flack from my colleagues um, in the environmental uh, sciences from this, in the conservation sciences from this, but um, my job um, at Small Island Sustainability is to uh, find ways, sustainable ways to have our environment work for us as we work for it. Um, And so the notion then that, uh, let's say a lake uh, that may have been visited by um, by local residents that would be used for this purpose that that would require um, you know some acceptance of we're going to have to give up you know that pure natural environment so that we can have the energy that we would need to have our civilization not just survive but thrive. Um, I believe that my greatest hurdle uh, would not necessarily be um, the engineering component. It would not be the scientific component. It would be uh, trying to convince people that, yes, this is in our collective benefit to do. But how do you rationalize that trade-off, though, in terms of a a pristine environment and then energy uh, production that feeds your socioeconomic health? How do you rationalize or balance? What's the threshold that you need to preserve? Like, how do you, what's the trade-off? Like, how do you assess that? How do you evaluate that moving forward? Um, I, I'll be very frank with you. Um, we can use New Providence uh, as it currently is as, as an example. Um, the Clifton Pear Power Plant is there. It produces um, a, a vast amount of energy that we use every single day, nearly three, uh, 24-7, 365. Now, at the same time, it is emitting vast quantities of uh, gases into our atmosphere not just CO2, but you have uh, methane, nitrous oxide, all of these different things that if you were to breathe these in, they will kill you, right? But the Clifton power plant is there, isn't it? Because if it was not there, then I can assure you, your ability to keep your hospitals, um, electricity, the schools, your police stations, your business, your homes could not be possible. And so that's the, you know, the stock is where I can put it. We have actually already made a decision and we made it some decades ago. We're simply finding another way of doing it that, uh, you know, luckily does not uh, come with emissions in CO2, the same gases that, you know, um, our prime minister is in Azerbaijan uh, trying to get the larger, wealthier countries to, um, to, to, sought out for us, right? You know, in terms of, um, uh, is a, you know, carbon credits and things like that um, to help us to adapt to climate change more readily. Those things are already being done. But when you consider um, your solar energy, we can get the same energy output, but without that CO2 emissions. And so really and truly, the choice is yours. You can determine what is more important to you. Do you keep the hospital open or do we close the Clifton Pear Power Plant now? you have a choice. And in the same way, your uh, solar array is more or less the same. We would have to make some changes to the environment, yes. But the benefit of that is that we get the power that we need out the corresponding CO2 emissions. And that's, that's, that's the reality of it. There's nothing more to say, that's what it is. I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. Is there a renewable energy scenario though, that can be implemented without there being negative consequences? Most certainly. Um, The holy grail of renewable energy is fusion. These would be um, the processes that power the sun itself, right? So you could imagine now taking two light atomic nuclei and smashing them together, you would get uh, energy out from that. That's the most uh, efficient way of doing it, most certainly. Our problem, of course, is that the technology to do that uh, on a large commercial industrial scale does not currently exist. Are we to shut down the Clifton Pear Power Plant 
you know, until Fusion comes online? No, we keep it online until something new becomes available and then we gradually phase out but it's not working anymore. That's one option. Um, but I think, um, you know, a better answer would be is that uh, I think Thomas, uh, Thomas uh, Sowell had a, a quote that in life, there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. And I tell my students every semester that my job isn't really to find a solution. No, it is to find um, different ways where the trade-offs would be more acceptable to us. Um, so solar energy is one avenue. You would have tidal currents to being another. Wind energy is yet another. Wave energy, yet another. Ocean thermal energy converter, yet another. But in every single case, there is going to be an environmental, a financial, socio-economic trade-off. And we're back to um, you know, the way that we see our world. We're gonna have to change our minds. We're gonna have to wonder if we're going to balance things one way versus the other, because there is no silver bullet. And anyone to tell you otherwise is lying to you. Okay, we are talking about renewable energy and research that is underway full throttle on floating solar panels. We'll take this break and be back after this. Chapter One Bookstore is proud to serve the students, faculty, and staff of the University of the Bahamas and the community at large. We are the premier choice for the purchase of university textbooks and supplies, and UB logo apparel, paraphernalia, and gifts. We also carry a wide variety of school supplies, learning aids, and leisure books. Visit our coffee center for all of your printing, copying, and binding needs. Chapter One Bookstore is located on the ground floor of the Michael H. Eldon Complex on University Drive. Shop with us on Monday through Saturday. You can contact us at 397-2650 or email at chapter1 at ub.edu.bs. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Chapter One Bookstore. Chapter One, the premier choice. Are you ready to take your knowledge or career to new heights? Don't wait to invest in your future, do it now. How? Earn a professional development certificate from University of the Bahamas. Whether you're looking to enhance your leadership abilities, sharpen your technical skills, or explore a new field entirely, our Continuing Education and Lifelong Learning Center has the ideal course for you. We offer single phase electrical, ethics and procurement, accounting for entrepreneurship, stop managing, start leading, dynamic presentations, digital marketing, superior customer service, and justice of the peace. We even have courses on smartphone photography, TikTok videos, defensive driving, and interacting with difficult people. Or open the door to new languages with English as a second language, conversational Chinese, and Spanish in the workplace. Our instructors are experts in their fields and they're here to support you every step of the way. Call us at 302-4449. Enroll today. Chapter One Bookstore is proud to serve the students, faculty, and staff of the University of the Bahamas and the community at large. We are the premier choice for the purchase of university textbooks and supplies and UB logo apparel, paraphernalia, and gifts. We also carry a wide variety of school supplies, learning aids, and leisure books. Visit our coffee center for all of your printing, copying, and binding needs. Chapter One Bookstore is located on the ground floor of the Michael H. Eldon Complex on University Drive. Shop with us on Monday through Saturday. You can contact us at 397-2650 or email at chapter1 at ub.edu.bs. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Chapter One Bookstore. Chapter One, the premier choice. Welcome back to University Drive. We're talking with Dr. Brandon Bethel, the program coordinator of the Small Island Sustainability Program at University of the Bahamas. Dr. Bethel is doing research on floating solar panels, and we're talking to him about implementation, what he's found out so far, and what we could potentially be in for. 
Dr. Bethel, tell us once again about the lakes or the coastal areas or the water bodies that you're considering for this installation and why you believe these are ideal. You mentioned here in Providence, and I also believe you're looking into Rum Key. Let's go back over that. Um, well, yes, yeah, so we chose um, we chose uh, islands of the Bahamas that um, say would have very large water bodies. And you know, believe it or not, Andres was dominating in that, that sphere. Um, but uh, we, we had to choose um, water bodies that would not have alternate economic, economic activities on them. Um, so that reduced our selection uh, quite significantly. So for example, um, while I wanted to use uh, Lake Rosa in Inagua, um, the Morton Salt Company is there doing its business and it would not take too kindly uh, for me doing you know, what I want to do there. Um, and so we tried to find uh, water bodies that were spread throughout uh, the archipelago near population centers so that every uh, community um, you know, from the north to the south can benefit uh, from the technology. And so that's, that's the approach that we took. Are there any unique challenges like salt water corrosion, weather patterns, or hurricanes when it comes to this kind of setup? Most certainly all of the above. Um, uh, salt corrosion, of course, is, a, is something that the land-based systems don't have to deal with, um, but that then requires now new materials um, at the underside of the panels now that would resist uh, that corrosion there. Um, we have something called a sacrificial anode. You install it onto the system itself. That will corrode rather than everything else. That's one uh, possible solution. But uh, in terms of the weather, um, in terms of hurricanes, now this, I think, is where um, our greatest uh, geophysical hurdle will be. That is, um, when we do have extreme activity, uh, and not just hurricanes, but you would have uh, cold fronts coming in, you would have, um, you know, thunderstorms. Um, these things you do you cannot do anything about. Right? They're going to happen. But what you can do is to forecast that activity so that you can make preparations. Uh, and so the system itself uh, will work more or less fine if you just put it out in the ocean, right? It'll, it'll be fine, right? But in terms of a, a, a long-term kind of sustainability, you absolutely, absolutely need to be able to observe the ocean and the atmosphere every minute of every day. But even then, that's not enough. You're going to have to be able to forecast changes in the ocean and the atmosphere uh, as you go along, simply because you don't want uh, to have a hurricane just jump on you while your array is out there. You, you don't want that. You want to have you know seven, um, three to seven days of time so you can make the assessment is um you know is this hurricane hurricane going to pose a threat and if so um can we disconnect can we move to a safe place can we can we do all of these things all of um these questions um will have to be answered over the next year of research and development but ultimately um i believe um that you know you know god gave us a a, a brain to use i believe that if we simply put our minds to it then even these challenges can be eliminated. And I can say that because these, uh, these systems, they exist um, worldwide. This isn't anything uh, particularly new um, that have to be you know, tested out you know, for 60 years before we can trust it um, you know, in the environment. No, this is a, we simply need to bring it in, adapt it to our unique challenges. That would be, of course, um, not just corrosion, uh, which would be faced everywhere, uh, but also the fact that we'd have hurricanes. And once you have that, um, you know, ocean observations, ocean American model, uh, modeling uh, skill, then this should not be an issue. This is an, an ocean engineering problem. And this ocean, enge ocean engineering problem is one that we've dealt with for hundreds of years. We simply have new tools to make it more efficient, more effective, at a cheaper cost. So I'm ready for the challenge. How would you secure a floating solar panel setup if severe weather threatens? What would you so do? The thing, the thing is that we won't secure it. Um, our goal is to disconnect it from the seabed and move it. Um, we don't anticipate that any structure would be able to deal with hurricane force winds and waves. That's not something we anticipate. And so ultimately we're gonna to have to develop strategies that will be based on the ocean observations, based on the ocean forecasting to simply disconnect the array uh, in small bite-sized pieces and move it to a safer location. The hurricane is not going to affect all of the country all at the same time. That's not going to happen, which means that we can identify uh, safe harbors for our system to be. We can most certainly do that. That's, that's I think, um, the best answer to that question there. 
Okay. And so how have you benchmarked um, this kind of research? Are there examples from other countries and regions where they're already using floating solar panels? And what can the Bahamas learn from their examples? Well, um, you know, I mentioned before that I spent about 11 years in China. China is more or less my second home now. And that's where I think um, you know, we can look to, uh, to get uh, some advice on how to manage these systems. Uh, another example would be Japan. Um, now, from the example, I saw that they had dealt with uh, typhoon activity, and that typhoon uh, caused extensive damage to their array. But the lessons learned uh, from that activity there would be useful, beneficial, immediately so for us here. That, that I think would be the best uh, two places to look, but uh, for our neighbors to the north, um, the parallels are not so, uh, not so clear cut, simply because they would have very large inland water bodies that don't face threats from hurricanes. And so while we can learn some things from there, I think the best um, avenue is to uh, have me head back to Asia, learn a bit more, and then come back. Okay, I think that you would have had to have done some forecasting um, for this research. How many solar panels, in what numbers, what kind of, and, and, and in relation to what kind of renewable energy, energy generation? So what kind of renewable energy generation are you projecting with the, with the implementation of these setups and by what year, if you are well, able to have it implemented? Let's say if financing was not an issue, then within the next two to three years, um, we should be able to satisfy and then exceed uh, our commitment to 30% renewables by 2030. Um, I, I believe if you know, the money was not a problem, that we can most certainly do that. Um, simply because our um, the amount of energy that we use is not very high to begin with, right? Um, but it means, and of course, that it's easier to deal with our demand. Um, one of the challenges would be uh, finding battery storage for such a large system. So I would not envision that we can take care of 100% of our needs, but for quite a few islands, we can get real, real close. Okay, and so what about the buy-in and support of government, of policymakers and regulators? Um, because it seems like that would have to be in place in order for um, such a research project and an operation to be implemented for you to move from research to full implementation. Yes, you're uh, absolutely right. Um, one thing uh, I am is a good boy. And when we have rules and regulations, we try to follow them. Um, and so we would want to, of course, reach out to the Department of, of Environmental Planning and Protection. That's our number one stop. Then we want to talk to IRCA, we want to talk to EPL, we want to have uh, all of these partners in place um, before, uh, let's say we roll out commercial, uh, let's say on a very, very large scale. Um, and so our next year would be to uh, investigate a very small system, 25 panels, I think, um, how much was it? Let's say no more than um, 10 kilowatts uh, of, of energy output. So very, very small. And we'll be able to see just how difficult it would be to manage such a system and then project out, uh, let's say in the next five, 10 years, if we were to scale up, what are some of the additional challenges that we have? But um, our partners um, at the Department of, of Environmental Planning and Protection, and I know, you know Dr. Neely personally, um, I would try to make sure that to get her, her go ahead, right? And make sure that we're doing things um, in the right way so that um, when we can, uh, let's say, go out on a much larger scale, we do so with the full knowledge and consent, of not just, let's say, the scientific community, but the larger community in general. So that's what we want to do. Okay, so what are your next steps? Because this research is still very much underway. Well, the next steps, uh, I think, beyond uh, getting the uh, government approvals to do the research, would simply be to find people who are interested. Let's say students, for example interested in building careers around this technology and I can assure you we're not uh, providing jobs here we're not providing a simple nine to five no we're providing a career something that you will invest your time your effort you know as I have your entire spirit in that is something that we would need uh, to move forward and then we get public buy-in you say that you know you as a homeowner you may not be able to have the space uh, for solar energy you may not have the finances to do it either but can we put solar energy on the grid for you to tap into, most certainly. And so once we can get that kind of buy-in uh, and we can have our approvals from uh, the government and the relevant regulators, it should be a simple matter of bringing uh, the infrastructure in country 
uh, because we don't, we don't possess the capacity to build them ourselves. Once you bring uh, the infrastructure in, we simply go back to BTBI and tell them, you know, give us your best. Give us the ones who want to build a new career and we'll go to work. And this is not just something where, you know, you want someone to install uh, the panels, run transmission lines. No, this is where now we're going to retrain an entire sector of society to now focus on ocean observations, numerical modeling, uh, artificial intelligence, all of these different things that you would need to support such an activity. All of that needs to be done. That, that I think, um, you know, it, it's, that is the most exciting part of this, trying to get society itself to say, yes, this is the direction we're going to take and we're going to send our best, we're going to send our brightest to get it done. Because we are small, yes, but the good news is we are small and things that are small can change very easily. We can do it. I'm glad you mentioned careers, careers of the present and of the future, careers where we are increasing our knowledge, we are increasing our capacity, um, and where we are giving ourselves a competitive advantage while at the same time preserving our earth. A lot of that outlook is present in the Small Island Sustainability Program at UB, where you serve as program coordinator. Tell us about the range of, of, of subjects and concentrations that are available as uh, some of our listeners are considering perhaps the future that they want to build for themselves? Well, I think um, one thing I would like to say initially is that, uh, let's say, if you want to build a career where you can serve your community with honor and distinction, especially in this area of climate change, especially in the area of the blue economy, Small Island Sustainability is the place for you. We offer uh, degrees for the environmental sciences, marine sciences. If you want to do the atmosphere, that's fine. Conservation, no problem. Some of our uh, our leaders, uh, like Taran Sims at Bahama, was a graduate of our program. Ashante Russell is a climate activist, has been to more countries than I've been to. Explaining to the planet why we need your help so that we can survive into the future. All of these individuals, plus more of graduates of our program. Um, so what we, what we need to do is we simply need to uh, reach out to the high schools. I, I'm looking at grade 10, 11, and 12. I see uh, different schools every other week trying to show um, our Bahamian students that we can be more than the traditional doctor, lawyer, nurse, accountant tracks that you know most Bahamians would have, um, let's say, be geared towards. You can be, like myself, a physical oceanographer. You can be an environmental scientist. You can be a soil scientist. My good friend, um, Dr. Williamson Gustav, is our nation's only, if I'm not mistaken, our only soil scientist. And he serves right here at Small Island Sustainability, turning um, students who may not have had an idea as to what they want to do with their, do their futures into the leaders of tomorrow. That is what our program offers. And we offer that now. And we'll offer it in the future. We'll offer it forever simply would need you um, as a prospective student to come on board and let us mold you into something that you could not have imagined yourself to be, just as my experience in China molded me into who I am today. And I can assure you, I really couldn't know who I was if not for that experience. And Small Island Sustainability offers you that uh, opportunity as well. So what are the exact degree options in SIS and are there minors? A student might want to pursue another path, but they want to have a minor that is SIS based. Yeah, so basically we offer um, marine science, but you'd have a, uh, a minor in sustainability. Um, there was, I think at some point, a tourism track, a um, sustainable tourism track um, that um, my good friend Taran Sims uh, embarked on. Um, in essence, you show up. If you want to do marine biology, we can find something for you. You want to do physical oceanography, we can find something for you. You want to be a soil scientist, we can find something for you. If you want to run a lab, your own lab, we can most certainly do that for you. Um, we, we have those programs in place. Um, environmental science is something that we're building uh, as we speak. Um, they're gonna be master's programs um, as the university does develop. And we, and if, if I can say so myself, that we at SIS, we want to position ourselves as the number one department in the university to handle, um, let's say the, the issues of tomorrow want to be able to turn uh, our prospective students into our leaders in government, our leaders in academia, 
all of those things are available right here at SIS. Do you think that the time is now for us to be having these conversations about small island sustainability and our present and, and how our present activities impact our future with primary school students, with junior high school students, so that we can get our younger citizens thinking more actively about the, the habits of mankind and how it's impacting our earth and what needs to happen? I think, no, it, the time is not now uh, to have this discussion. And I say that because the time should have been had uh, when Hurricane Dorian did what it did in Amakon Grand Bahama. That was when the discussion should have been had, simply because Hurricane Dorian type events, that's not going to be a freak event anymore. That's not going to become you know an every other year kind of thing. So no, the, the time isn't now. The time was a few years ago. We should have been having this discussion a long time ago. We should have uh, introduced um, you know, a program called Ocean Literacy. Um, that is where you, again, we live on an island, so this should, should be a no-brainer. You introduce ocean literacy to the primary school so that students can have um, a, a very basic understanding as to what the ocean is, what it means to you. And then as they grow, as they develop into, um, let's say junior high, high school, they would be able to graduate having a more than fair understanding of what our environment is doing to us and what we are doing to our environment. So no, the time isn't now. The time should have been some years ago. Absolutely. There is a sense of urgency. Okay. So wrapping up, Dr. Bethel, final thoughts as we uh, you know, have been talking about matters of small island sustainability and renewable energy, building our national capacity and extending new knowledge. Wrap up comments and thoughts. I think um, as we hear from our prime minister, every time that he goes to attend these conferences, every time that there's another COP, um, that we are in a climate fight. And whether you believe it or not, we are losing. And this is an existential problem. This is a fight that we cannot afford to lose. And so the thing that I want to impress uh, upon both yourself, my listeners, my students, whom I'm gonna pray are listening to this, is that we don't have time to waste. We are already several decades behind our larger neighbors who have started a, uh, a large scale transition to renewable energy technologies where you know, they have the solar panels, they have the wind turbines, um, they have tidal current, current energy generators. They have those in place now, but we don't have that. We're still waiting for others to do first before we do for ourselves, and that has to stop. And so what um, I aim to do, both on a personal and a professional basis, is to say that we're putting a stop to that now, that we're going to take the initiative, we're going to do what our neighbors haven't done before, we're going to eliminate uh, that hypocrisy that we have where we're complaining about climate change, yet we are emitting uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. Maybe not as much, not nearly as much as the others, but we are emitting nonetheless. That has to stop. And we aim to put a stop to that before I am old and great, so that my own children, my own grandchildren would not know what you know, a power outage was. That is, um, I think, the the defining moment of my career when I can tell my children, tell my grandchildren that I remember when, um, you know, the power was out for six hours and they'll say, but what, what are you talking about? The power is never out. And I'll have a very healthy chuckle and I'll tell them all about, you know, 2024 used to look like. Because us in 2044, this should be a past issue. That's what I aim to do. All right. It's all within reach. Change our mindset, change our future. Dr. Brandon Bethel, thank you so much for joining us here on University Drive. Thank you so much to our listeners for joining us as well. I'm Tamika Lundy. I've been your host saying bye-bye for now. University Drive is a production of the Office of University Relations at University of the Bahamas. All rights reserved.